Hello and welcome to the History of the Blood War series. I am your presenter, Jan Wilka, and I thank you for joining me for the third of three introduction videos for this series. What I want to do in this video is to explain my views on alignment in Dungeons & Dragons, especially in how it influences the Blood War. One of the goals for the History of the Blood War series is to present the Blood War in a way that is accessible to people who are using any setting or any rule set for their adventures. For Dungeons & Dragons, alignment is a fundamental aspect of how the game world works, but strict alignments are either used differently in other systems or not at all. If being tied to the essences of chaos and evil is an important part of being a demon, that makes it difficult to envision these kinds of demons in other spaces, so I want to explain D&D alignments in a way that can be easily picked up and ported to any system. Before I talk about the alignment poles themselves, I want to say a brief word on what alignment means to me and how that interacts with the world. When D&D refers to alignments, they are most often presented as innate qualities of a character, something that is reflected in the magic system. A person who is quote unquote lawful will be better able to summon lawful energies to aid them. If these aren't innate qualities, they are at least cosmic constants. They are the same for all beings no matter who you are or where you observe them from. This idea of good, evil, law, and chaos as cosmic anchors can be very limiting to characters because, especially with mortal characters, we view these beings as having free will and agency. A sense of absolute lawfulness implies that there is a cosmically correct way to be a lawful person, and that all truly lawful people will act in that way, and the same goes for absolute chaos, absolute good, and absolute evil. The problem with the concept of evil races is basically this. You acknowledge that these beings are sentient, but you aren't giving them the choice to act in a non-evil way. This is important because coding something as evil in Dungeons & Dragons means two specific things. Number one, that the evil being is devoted to acts of malice above all else. And number two, that it is okay to slay that being without a second thought. Orcs, goblins, gnolls, and so on having their default state be evil does little more than mark them out as creatures who can be used as thoughtless fodder for exciting battles. The drow, especially as they were thought of before the recent update to their presence, are an example of a better handled evil. For the drow, it's possible to conceive of them as quote unquote evil in a way that's separated from any notion of absolute evil based solely on their choices and actions. The drow were not created evil. The original drow chose to follow Lolth and became evil because of that. What keeps them evil is the way their society is structured. It's specifically made to weed out those who would oppose the group and to encourage those who will be devoted servants of Lolth. I will come back to alignment and non-mortal beings in a moment, but we can take it as read for now that Lolth's desires are what push the drow to do acts considered as evil, not the drow nature itself. That is to say, we can imagine a good drow being born in this society, but being corrupted by the society into being evil. Comparably, there is usually not a predominant society of good orcs, which the bad orcs seceded from. This shows itself in how differently drow are treated from orcs and goblins and kobolds and so on. Drow are not used as nearly mindless savages who it is okay to kill scores of. Their evil marks them as enemies to most players, yes, but they're presented as evil characters whose lives have value, and not nuisances at the edges of civilization who must be exterminated. Again, what's important for mortal characters, characters that we basically consider to be like us humans, is that they are able to have this kind of choice. For me, it's this choice that tells what a character's alignment will be, not their affinity for some universal constant. When we're dealing with non-mortal characters like demons, devils, angels, and so on, we can still think of alignment by choice, but I think there is a better way to understand them, one that makes more sense with these seemingly irrational creatures like demons. These beings may have internal drives that make them do things which we would describe as good, evil, and so forth. For instance, if we knew of a creature that exclusively ate young human children, 
we would probably think that creature was evil. Would it matter if the creature was very personable or if the creature donated some gold coins to another town? Probably not. Now, if this creature was to stop eating children, the creature would die. If we think like this, even though we are calling the creature evil, this isn't really a question of morality. The creature does not have to enjoy the fact that they eat children and it does not have to shut itself off from other choices. What makes it reprehensible to us is just the fact of how it works. Again, mortals aren't like this because one of the major traits of a mortal creature is being similar to humans or animals in terms of how their biology works. Outsider beings such as angels can be sustained by more metaphysical occurrences. However, we should still refrain from labeling such beings as essentially good, evil, etc. It should always be driven by what they do rather than being something innate within them. That is to say, using the same idea as from the earlier creature, an angel is not good because it has a good essence. It is considered good by us because it's sustained by providing aid and service, things that we also consider to be good. Let me break down the basic alignments a little bit more to elaborate on what I mean. Good is really centered on the idea of aid. Healing is probably the purest expression of good, but anything from rescue to advice to providing food are acts of goodness. Good energies, such as those in spells like Holy Sword, should generally be thought of as purifying energies, but healing energies would also be considered good. Evil is about malice that comes from selfishness. Causing injury, pain, and so forth on purpose is the basic nature of evil. Being a thief is not evil, but being a thief who primarily steals from the disadvantaged in order to gain their own comfort is evil, since the outcome of that theft caused malice even though it wasn't needed for the thief to do that. The thief would have survived without um, doing that particular deed. While good is about doing things for others, possibly at your own expense, evil is about doing things for yourself explicitly at the expense of others. Evil energies, such as in spells like Desecrate, should be thought of as corrupting energies, which can be the same thing as, or separate from, the force which animates the undead. Law is about providing and preserving structure. While good and evil can be thought of as being about one's ideals, law and chaos are more about how one deals with the world around them. Beings who are more lawful see the value in making and sticking to rules for society. Acts of law involve linking people together and respect for customs over present situations. Lawful energy, such as an order's wrath, should be thought of as fixating or paralyzing energy. Chaos, as the opposite of law, is about breaking apart structure and pushing people apart. Whereas law attempts to build something out of nothing, Chaos tries to make nothing out of something. Chaotic actions have to be understood in opposition to lawful ones. It's not simply about individualism, it's about forcing things out of their usual patterns. Chaotic energy, like that in Chaos Hammer, can be thought of as entropic or dissolving energy. Now, when we consider how this affects the major players in the Blood War, the devils and the demons, we have to think about how they fit in with these ideas about alignment. Devils are considered to be both lawful and evil because they find their sustenance in pain and suffering. The way for them to get the most nourishment out of any one soul is to extend that torture for as long a time as possible. This may be an immersion-breaking reference, but if you've seen the original Monsters, Inc. movie, their economy running on the terror of children is a very tame version of how the devils gain their sustenance. What makes this need to cause pain into a lawful trait is that bureaucracy can prolong both pain and free time. Those who are on the bottom of a hierarchy are casually ground under its heels, abused by everyone above them. Those who are above not only get to feed off the pain of those below them, they have more time to indulge in their various favorite tortures and oppressions. Lower devils covet the kind of privileges that higher devils have, so they don't rock the boat. 
if everything were to break down, then that lower devil would never get to be the kind of sadistic tyrant that they dream of being. Demons, on the other hand, are chaotic and evil because their sustenance comes from destruction. This should be thought of literally as in breaking a structure down into smaller and smaller parts, but also metaphysically. A demon will gain more from breaking something, changing it from a thing into nothing, than from just damaging it. The best analogy I've come up with for making this clear is breaking a table. To us, if we were to break a table, we would probably consider there to be two half tables left. For demons, when a table is broken, what is left is no table. Ontologically, that is to say, talking directly about the meaning of the words and what being actually is, a half table is not a table. It doesn't meet the basic criteria for being a table. A half table that's broken um, can't hold anything on it the way that a regular table would. You can't write anything on it on like a flat surface the way you would with a table and so on and so forth. That's the sense in which demons need to destroy. The pain they cause is almost secondary. Their goal is to slay and to turn people into not people, or in other words, to destroy them. Consuming is the same thing as destroying for demons. It's really just a matter of what any particular demon desires. So all of this is a good encapsulation of how I view the differing natures of devils and demons and how I think that the D&D alignment system can be translated into a series of drives and choices and tendencies that can work with other systems. Um, again, this isn't really to say that if you would prefer to play with a strict alignment system that you're wrong for doing that. But what I wanna do here is to expand this in such a way that anybody can come to this and say, okay, I can really put this into whichever way I want. If you wanna put this right back into the D&D framework, that's perfectly fine. And obviously everything will work out, you know, uh, um, like it's meant to because it is meant to it's it's designed with these strict alignments in mind again um i hope that you have found something interesting in this video i hope it's given you a little bit more insight into how i am tackling these issues as i go through and make more videos about the blood war um i would really appreciate your support so if you would like and subscribe and, um, you know, support me on my other platforms, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Patreon. I would really appreciate it. Um, the more support I get, the more driven I am to produce more content. So, um, yeah, I hope you guys are enjoying everything. And I really appreciate you um, taking the time to listen to these intro videos. Thanks. Thanks.